ultra running. It's growing. People want to give this sport a go. The adventure, the unknown, the challenge, whatever it is, it's definitely exciting. And having spoken to so many people on this show already, this is something that I can see things are starting to come together and it's time to pull some of it together. Hello and welcome to the Ultra Running Podcast with me, Coach Marshy. So I hope you're all well and I hope your training is going really well out there, whatever it is you're training for at the moment. And for those of you that are in those races, um, that adventure is the enjoyable part and that regardless of the results that you're enjoying that experience and enjoying your journey along the way. Okay, so let's take a slightly different approach on this episode and let's re- review some of of the past guests and what's gone on because having spoken to so many people on this show already and to be honest full of information and knowledge I'm starting to see that there there are things that you could pull together and that you could apply to your training and having spoken to those people they're the things that you can do and the impact that it can have on on our own training is certainly something that we should consider so I wanted to go over three kind of things, which as a coach, you know, in my other kind of part of life, um, other than this podcast, I do um, a lot of coaching and I own my own gym. And I think I'm starting to pull things together. And I just want to consider that when it comes to ultra training, so you're ultra running and you're training for it and that mindset behind it, pulling sort of these three things together could have a kind of massive impact on that. So. We're going to start off by going and heading over to a, to a section of an interview I did with um, Peter Francis, the author of Running From Injury. Peter was on one of the early episodes and this particular section, let's just have a listen to what Peter said. When you talk about running injuries and you talk about those common injuries that we've kind of touched on there, what would you say is the the kind of common, the common causes and What's the common solution to that as well? So um, I, I always like to, to, with an injury, look for the biggest uh, factors that are going to make the, the most amount of difference and then and then work into some of the other factors. So, you know, the number one risk factor, risk factor for most injuries in most sports is going to be previous injury. So uh unfortunately there's not much you can do about that so whatever injuries you've had in the past are gonna uh increase your likelihood of getting a, a new one so th- so so it's good to know that but it it, it doesn't help us a huge amount the sec the second thing is uh change in loading so uh if you increase your miles uh too quickly that will cause a problem but that's an easy one to see but think about other things if you change your surface too quickly or if you change your footwear too quickly or you know so anything where you change a variable too quickly is gonna is gonna cause a problem now the next thing then is like um low movement variability so running is a sport that's repetitive in nature there is not uh very much uh variability in it anyway now we can make that better or we can make it worse so if you run at the same speed you know the same distance the same loop the same you know there's very little movement variability there so you're gonna probably increase your your likelihood of an overuse injury whereas if you were able to you know interject some changes of pace into your running interject uh some hills into it um you know maybe interject some training outside of running like yoga or or, uh, circuit training or or whatever um you're going to increase the the variability so low movement variability um would be another factor and then you see we're going from previous injury changing something too quickly 
uh, lack of movement variability, um, then we can start to get into things that might be interesting, like, you know, uh, biomechanics and, and, and so on. Um, yeah, there is a certain style of running probably influenced as well by, by, by the, the height and the weight of the runner as well. That does play a role. But I would say most people want to start there. Whereas what I would say is, unless you've looked at the bigger, the bigger factors that make the bigger difference, um, then, you know, don't, don't sweat about getting a detailed biomechanical analysis, because let's say we get that biomechanical analysis, we fix all the, the things that we think are wrong in your stride or whatever it is. If you change your load too quickly, or if you do too much of the same thing, it doesn't matter. <laughs> so yeah, yeah, yeah. It, like, you've got to you've got to you've got to start with the big factors first, and then and then get into the to the small ones. So, so what would you say the top big factors are? Like, if you had to really just list them, uh, so uh, changing your training too quickly, yeah, is the is the main one. Yeah, um, and doing too much of the same thing, I would say, yeah. is the is the second one. So taking that into account, you know, what Peter's saying there, if we think about like training load and variability and you think about that in two concepts, so, or two aspects, sorry. So aspect one is the running specific training or running training. So, you know, like Peter said, running up hills, um, running at different speeds, those things are variables. So you can think of it from that point of view the variability, but you can also think about the variability in terms of that other work that you do. You know, Peter mentioned yoga and circuit training, that sort of training, you know, strength and conditioning, the movements that you're doing within the gym, how they can have an impact as well on that variability and how that variability, we were talking about injuries in that episode, um, very much how we can prevent injuries. And the best thing about what Peter had to say was that we're not talking about what people get hung up on here. You know, like, like he says, biomechanical analysis and things like that. Let's, let's go a bit broader and wider, like he says, and think about things that you can affect immediately, like the variability or, or the load and that variability in the two aspects is both in what you're doing with your running. So in that episode, we went on to talk about barefoot as well and how you can use barefoot running as a tool as well within your training um, so that would be a way of creating variability within your running, but also um, the speeds that you're running within that and whether you're running up or downhill as well. If we can add those variable things into our training, not only is it like we did in that interview going to prevent, help prevent injury or make you stronger, but actually it's going to make an overall better kind of rounded process for your training program and where you are in your ultra training. So that's kind of the running specific, the more movement gym specific stuff as well. Variability. Think about joint movement, right? Think about your gait analysis, whether you're an experienced runner and you know exactly what I mean by that. And you've looked into your gait analysis in terms of the whole where you load and everything else, or whether you're just new to this and you are the idea of a gait analysis or, or your gait cycle is basically the motion of running from when your foot leaves the ground to when it next touches the ground. If we think of it as a really basic concept, that's fine as well. Think about the angles that your joints are getting into during that process. So where the knee is, where the hip is, you know, what the, what the ankle's doing and how it moves. So within the gym environment, circuit training, yoga, you know, any strength and conditioning that you can do, we can look at things like the range of motion of those movements. And within the range of motion of those movements, we can kind of work greater or, or what we call is overload in terms of not overload in terms of intensity or um actual load but overload the the range of motion that you would normally be used to within running and make it stronger beyond those ranges and within the normal range as well there's massive advantages to that because that variability that you're creating there that peter talks about by doing some strength training around it 
you're actually going to make that joint stronger. So if you do hit something in your training, you know, we're going to go on to the next section in a moment and talk about surfaces. When, when we like meet things and it takes our body out of the normal linear line and the range of motion, we want to be strong within that range of motion so that we can come out of that, whether that be a big step up, a big step down, hitting a curb, hitting a rock, whatever it is. We want to be able to be strong within our joints and come out of that as well and make sure that we are able to continue the run pretty much unfazed from that. So that's kind of what I'm talking about in terms of the gym side of variability. We can get that variability in there so that if you meet something unexpected out there on the trail, in the mountains, on the road, wherever you are, you are prepared and strong enough to come out of that other side and be able to continue on with that run. So something else I wanted to consider, and I just mentioned it there, was surfaces. When training for ultra running, you want to consider surfaces. So we're going to head over to a section of an interview that I did with Emily where we were talking about surfaces. So let's just hear what she had to say first. So lots of different surfaces in this race over at Norfolk. And so this is clay on sea round to Great Yarmouth. So there's, to my knowledge, sand, shingles, trails, a bit of road. And then there's that kind of sand dune, which although it's sand, it's very different to just running on sand as well. So how did you find that, the change in surfaces? Yeah, I think I I trained well on a on a mix of surfaces. I mean, I don't have a beach next door to my house, so I wouldn't say I trained an awful lot on sand and shingle, but I've got a good pair of trail shoes that I know move and adjust as they need to and actually hats off to them I didn't get a single blister in those whole however many hours it was 9 10 11 12 I can't remember hours of running um so I, th- I knew that I was prepared and that I shouldn't shouldn't have any negative effects from it I suppose in terms of fatigue you yeah your muscles are constantly adapting to what you're putting them through I I found thank you to my body for dealing with it very well. I actually coped very well with it, but I can see why I know there are a few runners out there who were struggling, constant adapting takes its toll. Yeah. And that first bit when the whistle goes, did you know it was shingle to start with? Was that explained to you? Yeah. I'd seen on the Facebook group and a few people had put like just heads up runners um, from previous years. So I knew we knew it was coming, but I don't know it's in in night where you can't actually see there was no there was no end point and obviously you can look at your watch and think oh okay I've got maybe two two and a half miles left but at that that did especially at the start of the race mentally that was quite a big challenge to overcome but equally when it was done and you're then off the shingle onto the I think it was onto kind of a grass cliff then it's like right let's go yeah. it's quite refreshing for the legs to then have get a bit of traction and, and move forward yeah, no, I can I can imagine that, that that initial sort of first few steps off was really nice, and then you probably kind of adapted, and you, like you said, perhaps off you go. Um, that that shingle, by the way, so I'm told, many races that we know of in the ultra world can be affected by sort of coastal tide times and and things like that. And apparently in 2019, which was the inaugural year, the tide was out, so the guys actually got to run on the on the hard sand right by the sea which I can imagine would have been a completely different experience for them um, compared to, say, the shingle in 21 that you guys experienced. So um, going off that onto the sort of sand dune, so probably just over halfway, you, you go to the inside aid station. And then as you come out of there, once you get back on the coastal path, it's pretty sand dune right? You're pretty up and down. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, the sand was... Probably, I'd I'd say I found the sand even tougher than the shingle. Right. Okay, so Emily and I are there talking about surfaces and lots of different surfaces within the race that, that she was running. And I think when it comes to ultra running, we would be stupid to not be specific with our surfaces. And, and what I mean by specific and specificity is making sure that we run on lots of different surfaces. Lots of ultra marathons are subject to weather condition changes, things that will change if it's been a dry period, a wet period, or even potentially wet overnight. It can change with an instant. It can be different. So 
Emily and I there discussed about a race that she did in Norfolk regarding the different services. And the reason that's a really good section of, of clip for me to use there as an example was that that race had pretty much everything on it. Um, sand, sand dunes, um, concrete, shingle, you name it. It was rocky in places as well. Um, although no elevation, but it was rocky, like sort of big man-made rocks as sort of weather defences against the coastline. But, you know, they had to run on them and get over them and things like that as well. So, you know, that was a good example of how surfaces will change within an event. But also within the ultramarathon world, my limited experience, if you like, compared to some of the absolute elites out there, um, the amount of difference that I found in the surfaces that I run on in just the, the races that I've experienced, let alone the ones that the guys that have come on this show and have spoken about have experienced. The difference in surfaces is huge. So we need to make sure we're getting that kind of experience uh, on those different surfaces. And in particular, when you're doing an event, have you done a recce for that event? So when I say a recce, I mean, I've done a few recces recently that, I didn't actually make it to the start line due to injury, but I still managed to get out there and was trying to prepare in the right way and was considering it as part of the process of training is that doing a recce. Now, you don't have to run that. It'd be good to run sections of it, um, but you could walk bits of it, check things out, see how things are changing throughout the course that you're going to be on. And then that way you've got some idea of how to go away, implement that within your training and see if you can make a difference in a period of time from when you recce to when the race starts on those surfaces that are specific, maybe nearer your home or, or, or near to you, you're able to do something that replicates that. Or you just perhaps realize it's going to be really unstable ground so that within the gym, if we go back to Peter's point in in clip one, we can talk about that variability and try and get some work done within the gym around that. And then also expecting the unexpected when it comes to services. So there is going to be things that aren't the same as where you've trained or the trails that you train on at home. So it's really important that you make sure that you get out there and train on things and you don't necessarily know everything about the route so that you can get used to that mindset and that focus of changing onto surfaces that are slightly different as well. So the third and final thing to consider is something that comes from my interview with, with Ian Storer, and this comes around sort of the mindset, but let's just hear what Ian had to say first. So, so far then in your ultra experience, what would you say is the worst thing you've ever experienced so far? Worst thing in an ultra experience? Yeah. Um, uh, I think probably it's it's having to learn the hard way, um, which I think everyone probably does have to do. You know, that fact is when you're used to running races where you can go flat out to the limit of your ability um, and, and can sort of wing it um you can't really translate that into ultra running so you have to get used to the fact that at the beginning you feel like you're running very slowly and within yourself knowing that i should ask the right thing to do i got so used to running races where i went out as hard as i could and i knew if i faded it didn't matter too much um and i made that mistake with some of the ultras i did run at the beginning um and even that one that i described where i ran it i did go out really quickly and um you know the the, the last lap of that that grim reaper that i talked about wasn't pretty yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. i mean it was also a super hot day i think it was over 30 degrees that day and actually part of the reason why i won it in fairness was a lot of the people did actually drop out so um it was purely grit and determination that kept me going but it was painful and another one i ran once which again was a fantastic event but i got my pacing all wrong was a pedder's way and again i did okay and i got over the line in the end but the pain i had to go through in the last 10 miles was hideous um so i think that the, the worst thing about it is having to learn those lessons and learn it the hard way. And the only way you can, can do it is by making some mistakes. But now I can pace much better. I know myself. I know my body. I know how to fuel better. Um, I know the sorts of things that I can take on board as well at what points in the race. So a lot of that's more comfortable now. And also I know how my body feels. So I know each time, uh, I don't want to put people off, but I know you're going to feel rubbish <laughs> at some point. And I know when that's going to come. So when I start feeling that way, I know I'm going to get through it. So those sort of doubts of I'm not going to be able to do this go away. It's like, well, I'm just going to have to see see this next half hour through and then I'll feel fine again. OK, so really interesting to listen to Ian there and even listening back myself. Um, it's, it's a kind reminder that 
the ultra running world is is very different and that doesn't take anything away from you know up to marathon training or the road races of this world you know it doesn't take anything away from that we've got road races in the ultra world as well but what i think ian's trying to say there is that where we can really push hard and know that we can still get to the end i don't think in ultra running it's quite the same and i think expecting to fail or learning or fail as you learn or learn as you fail and that process of what you know what breaks you can make you stronger and you know you've taken a negative into a positive i think those things are something that i personally did which i speak about on on a previous episode where i got interviewed and i think when it's a sport where the best in our sport the elites turn up and they don't always know that they're going to finish i think it's something important for our mindsets um in the ultra world to get round that we don't know it's not it's not like and i mean this with the utmost respect to the to the running community i'm part of that community and i get how hard it is even to start off as a non-runner but you kind of can know that you're going to get to the end of a 5k even if you walk or crawl you you can get there but the ultra world isn't quite like that and i think it's really important to consider that if the elites don't know how do we know and i think what ian sort of says there about you can go out really hard at the beginning and then you have to make sure you consider you know you, you, you can get to the end of a marathon still even if you've gone and blown up a little bit and gone hard that's not how it's going to work in an ultra the body's going to respond very differently so i think it's really important for our mindsets to get into this way of thinking that um although we want to finish these challenges and we want to get out there and, and achieve more and go to the next level we actually also need to consider that there is always going to be a chance that we might not make it um and that's not giving up that's not being negative that's just being a realistic person and being realism and making that come into your mindset so that you know that when you're training you can focus on these things like fueling so that you don't run out of steam and that you don't run out of energy whereas you do that in a marathon or a 10k or half marathon you, you can you can survive you can keep surviving to the end of the race and you can make it in an ultra that's very unlikely to happen so i think it's important to take on board what ian's saying there and trying to use that around your planning training and mindset i know i certainly have so in conclusion we know there's so many factors and the three that we just mentioned are not limited it's not limited to these three by no shape or form however but when you think about the variability training on different terrain and services and having a mindset where you know you have to expect the unexpected and could fail there's certainly three things to consider when we're doing our ultra training and when we're moving forward to applying things in our day-to-day -day life of our ultra training process so i hope you enjoyed the show i hope it was something that was insightful was slightly different i just wanted to give it a different take and and take some of that good information that we've got and kind of combine it and show how they can work together to create something that we can consider in our training and if it is something that you enjoyed please do give us a little review and give us a rating on whatever platform it is that you are watching and also if there's anyone that you think you've had a conversation with or that that they could really gain from what i've just said um, and what the guys have said on those interviews then please by all means send it over send the link to them share it with them and, and let them know what we've had to say the full interviews for the three um, shows that we've pulled those clips from are available as well um if you just look at the ultra running podcast on whatever platform you're watching then um or listening you will be able to find those rightly as well i'll pop the episode numbers in the descriptions for you so with that being said i hope you've enjoyed the show and i hope we can meet here again to discuss more on the ultra running podcast with me coach marshy <laughs>